Welcome to Beyond the Art, where creativity knows no bounds and innovation takes center stage. Join us on a captivating journey through the realms of the Native American art world, exploring the untold stories, inspirations, and the sheer brilliance that fuels the world of Indigenous artistry. Welcome to Beyond the Art, and today we have with us Martha Berry. Welcome to the show, Martha. Thank you so much. I'm delighted. Well, why don't we just go ahead and jump right into it. Can you share with us a bit about your journey into bead artistry and how your Cherokee heritage has influenced your work? Absolutely. I um, I was born and raised in Tulsa at a, because my father had, like so many people his age, had to immigrate out of the Cherokee Nation as a result mm -hmm. of allotment. And uh, we settled in Tulsa, and uh, I grew up a banker's daughter. And um, I was very proud of my Cherokee ancestry, but I really didn't know anything about the culture. I just never had a chance to learn. And mm -hmm. um, I was particularly curious about my father's mother. Um, I had heard so many great things about her. She was an educated woman. She had a college education even way back at the end of the 1800s. She had a college education. She um, was much loved by everybody who knew her. They raved about how generous and smart and hardworking and intelligent she was. And she was a little bit of a spitfire, I think. She was very much the matriarch and an itty bitty little thing. And uh -huh. um, But I just, I loved my mom's mom, but I never had a chance to even meet my dad's mom because she had passed away before I was born. So I just had this huge curiosity about what it was in me that I had inherited from her, what it was in me that was Cherokee and that was from mm -hmm. my dad's side of the family, as opposed to what was from my mom's side of the family. And um, so when middle age hit and I had kids that were in middle school and high school, I decided to really learn about this. And I sat down with uh, my Cherokee history, my James Mooney Cherokee history book, and my family genealogy beside it, so I could know what generation and what of my ancestors came through what major events. Correct. And I just, it just really made, it really satiated that need, but it made me so hungry for more. And, um, and so I thought, you know, maybe if I did the things that I know that she might have done, that all the little thousands of decisions you make along the way, mm -hmm. somehow I'd find that bonding experience. And I had always been good with needle and thread. And of course, all Native American women beat, right? right. And um, so I, I went down to the hobby shop and I bought a stack of how-to books and a bunch of really, really crappy materials because I didn't know what to use. Right. And, um, excuse me, my phone's ringing. No worries. <laughs> and um, I, uh, I came home and started making mistakes and learning from them. And But the more I s continued to study Cherokee history, I would run into photographs of artifacts. And the, I realized that all the things that I was making, all the things that I knew about beadwork, indigenous beadwork at that time, didn't look anything like the artifacts that had been made by the Cherokee. And I thought, okay, that's what I want to be doing. I want to be doing what my people did. Right. And, um, and so that, so it started. I, there was nobody doing it, nobody teaching it. There weren't any books about it. There was no way to learn it except to copy from the artifacts and uh, the photographs of the artifacts. And Correct. so that's what I started doing. And it took a number of years to figure out the kind of materials that they used. It's always been important that I use the materials that they use, that I could do as many things the way they did them as I could. Because I didn't want to just copy what they made. I wanted mm -hmm. to do what they did. And um, and that's how it that's how I started. That's how it all started. Road. It it just sort of happened. It was an accident. It just sort of happened. Right. You know? And here I am and I absolutely don't regret one moment I've spent at the bead bench or with a needle and thread in my hand, or teaching for that matter. Yeah. What fascinates you most about this medium, about the bead artistry? Oh, wow. I think what I have to say that there is so much in the beadwork of the Cherokee 
and the other southeastern tribes, which mm-hmm. Cherokee, Creek, Choctaw, Chickasaw, Seminole, and some smaller ones, but that's the big famous five. Um, the beadwork of our people from the 1800s still reflects so much from the mounds, which, you know, the, the mound culture had pretty much dissipated by the time right. of um, first contact, of our first contact. And, um, but you see um, design, design motifs, for example, from pottery in the mounds appearing on the beadwork of the, of our people, the South Asian people in the 1830s, in the 1800s. Mm-hmm. So even after the missionaries had arrived, even after people were speaking English and learned to read and write English, even after they were adapting uh, clothing and housing styles and government styles and judicial styles from the non-Indians that were surrounding mm-hmm. them, permeating them, um, still those messages were coming through. And I just, to this day, I get teary and kind of tingly when I think about that's those people talking to me and you and everybody who looks at that work and saying, this is not forgotten and it matters. It matters and it's part of our DNA of who we are as a people exactly. as we continue to grow. Right. Our It's our <sighs> physical DNA and it's our mental and our spiritual DNA. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. How do you typically start a new project and where do you find your inspiration for your designs? That's a tiny little question. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay. Well, it just it starts with a seed in my brain, you know, and it'll be something that has been bothering me, something um, that has, you know, about which I may feel a little angst. And I'm the first to tell you I'm spoiled. I've always been spoiled. I admit it. I always have been. And so if I say I have angst, it just sounds like, oh, she's whining. Well, you know, <laughs> I have some things that bother me too. And um, so some of the, the most memorable pieces I created out of angst, you know, the uh, uh, be work about quant- blood quantum. Blood quantum mm-hmm. just drives me crazy. I think it's a genocidal tool and I hate it. And um, a certain contemporary political persons uh, or beliefs sometimes creep in and blast onto my beadwork. And uh, it's it's very sort of healing for me you know, at a time when it's, uh, I don't necessarily agree with politics of the people around where I live. And um, <laughs> uh, and so so that some, some of us, but not all, not all of it by any means, but some of us out of angst. A lot of it is about um, just a huge desire to tell the stories of of my own family and of our journeys and of, you know, my journey with my husband and my ancestor's journey, his ancestor's journeys, and uh, uh, as sort of as a gift to our girls, to our daughters. Um, and, um, and occasionally, well, I love to tell Cherokee mythology. I, I love to do that in my work. Um, but the bottom line, honestly, I like to make pretty things. <laughs> I mean, I do. Comes down to that. I love beadwork. <laughs> I love color and I love sparkle. I mean, you know, oh, shiny. And I I like that. And it's in my work. You know, it's a, some people might think it's a little gaudy. Um, some people might think it's a little too conservative. I don't know. But anyway. So when you start the process and you have an idea rolling around in your mind, do you draw it out or do you just go to it and start working and creating that? No, I draw everything out. In yeah. fact, I draw everything out on a quarter inch graph paper. Um, and I, I, you know, I cut strips the length of the, of a, the strap of a bandolier mm-hmm. bag or a sash, if I'm doing a sash. And then I cut another piece that is the size uh, of the entire piece of fabric that will be the pouch, which is, you know, the, the front that folds in, the solid back, and then the flap that folds over. Mm-hmm. And um, I draw it out on a quarter inch graph paper because I want to know that I can say what I need to say and have enough room to say it. And numbers are, matter a lot to me. I like to repeat motifs. Um, 
like two times or four times or seven times. So those are big numbers in Cherokee mythology. Um, and I want to know I've got enough room for that. I don't want any surprises at the end. Um, and I, I always try to obey the sort of the rules that, that uh, permeate Cherokee beadwork and, and Southeastern beadwork. And one of them is that one side of the strap is one design and the other side uses the same colors, but it's a different design. Mm -hmm. So that when the bandolier bag is being worn and you're looking at the person from the front, it looks different from the look from the back. And uh, so you, it gives you a full four, a three-dimensional look at something. It's a, right. you know, and, um, and so, you know, so I just want to make sure I have room. And then I, I sit down and I pick my design and draw just basically just line drawing because you start with one line of beadwork and then you build, you fill or you build oh, yeah. out or whatever. And um, I use my, God bless my desktop photocopier because if I design it's too big, I can shrink it down. And if it's not big enough, I can blow it up until it fits mm -hmm. the space that I need. So, yeah, I have no problem. I use all authentic materials and authentic techniques and lots of electric lighting and a steam iron and a desktop printer. You know, I mean, <laughs> I, that, because that's who we are, isn't it? Right. That's who true, we all true. are. We are who we are right now, but we are so full of more of, right. of what we had. And um, so it makes the beadwork, beadwork, I'm sorry. I yak all day. You get me started. Hey, it's good. Question. That's why you're here. <laughs> you want to see the, the importance of our work and why it is so sad that it was so forgotten is that it is um, a metaphor, a three-dimensional metaphor for the time in which it was created. What our ancestors did in the 1700s, late 1700s, early 1800s, they took what were ancient design and construction influences, things that you can see from the human drawings, the human effigies in the mound, in the mounds. Mm -hmm. You can see bandolier bags, you can see sashes, you can you can see them right there. They took those same designs and motifs and construction and merged them with what was for them state-of-the-art materials that they got bold colored beads and beautiful ribbon, beautiful fabrics from the Europeans and they merged them together in this amazingly beautiful and unique art mm -hmm. form that um, illustrated who they were at a time, like I said, when they were, they were merging everything else, they were merging that in their culture. And what I think beadwork more than anything else merges those two um, essential parts of who we were at the time. Um, mm -hmm. And then just continue to be, um, passed down and continue to carry the messages uh, through this art form. You mentioned angst being part of your inspiration, so to speak. How do you intertwine your Cherokee heritage and culture into your beadwork? And is there any specific stories, symbols, or traditions from Cherokee culture that consistently appear in your artwork? Oh, God, yes. Um, and most of them, the ones that consistently appear, Mm -hmm. are all either designs taken right out of the mounds from pottery, shell carvings, uh, copper incisings, um, or they are a slight adaptation of that. And they're the same ones now that all of the Southeastern people ha have, have, have found. They're enjoying a renaissance. These same symbols, these same messengers, um, are in our architecture, they're in the carpet right. on the floor of our resorts, mm -hmm. they're in the the, ra the balcony railings. I mean, you see them all the time. And um, it, it, I love that because some of them were uncertain of the meaning. We need a Rosetta Stone so bad. Yeah. But um, even if we don't know exactly what they meant, they still bless us because they were the they were the messages that were being sent and appreciated at the time, mm -hmm. and um, there was I found a quote True. years ago in a book by an Eastern Band elder who said that in the beadwork the uh, the images and the motifs and the flowers that were in the beadwork were messages and telegrams from our ancestors in the mounds, and I thought yeah yeah 
They are. They, they're mm-hmm. who we are. Mm-hmm. So I personally think not only the more I expose myself to that, the more I expose people who view my work to those symbols, the more blessed they are and the more that message gets through one way or the other. And, um, you know, we're all, especially those of us who work with these symbols all the time, artists and um, weavers and beaters, um, we're all constantly trying to figure out what this stands for. And every once in a while we have a little breakthrough and it's just like, wow, right. <laughs> I understand a little more, you know, and I owe it to those people from the mounds. I owe it to them to, to appreciate them. Mm-hmm to study them and to teach them in whatever way I can. And this is the way I do it. You know, I just beat something on something and hang it on the wall. And <laughs> that's what I can do. That's my little part, you know? Well, it's, it's challenging and rewarding in, in the same aspect at the same time, you know? Um, given that, what are some of the challenges you face as a beat artist and how, how have you overcome it? And on the flip side, what are the most rewarding aspects of creating beat art for you, for yourself? Um, well, one of the hardest things, um, uh, is, is for me at least was to figure out, first of all, what were authentic materials and then to figure out how do you get fabric from revolutionary war era? How do you, how do you get that? Right. How do you get ribbon that is hundred percent silk? I mean, you can't even go into the typical fabric store or hobby shop and find hundred percent silk ribbon. And, um, it, it seems like a simple thing, but it right. makes a difference in how your piece looks. And, it, and if you're trying to make a tribute to a group of people or to somebody, the least you can do is use the right stuff, you know. And um, so I finally figured out I, I um, get my Stroud cloth, from the, which is the fabric that is the, the background fabric for bandolier bags. Well, for all Southeastern beauty workers that moccasins. And um, one of the reasons it's important is that in our bead work, we do we don't do like um, lazy stitch where everything is just covered in beads. Mm-hmm. Um, we do a, a totally different kind of stitch that allows us to do curvilinear designs, which it allows us to do all those designs from the mounds, and um, they uh, leave the background fabric to show. And I think it's because. They liked that heavy wool stroud. There, it's always either in a dark navy blue or in a scarlet, and it's a very thick wool. And uh, what I found out was it came from Stroud, England. The red wool stroud is the same exact red wool that was used in British soldiers' uniforms. Uh, you, you know, the red coats are coming. The red coats are coming. Well, that's what they were right. wearing. They yep. were wearing red scarlet, red stroud cloth. And um, they traded copious amounts of the scarlet and the midnight and the midnight blue to the tribes of the southeast and all through the eastern part of the U.S. at that time period. And mm-hmm. um, so, Stroud England still produces that cloth. And I have a fella I have found now who, um, for a while, you could get it, and then you couldn't get it at all. And mm-hmm. now, if you know people, <laughs> you can get it. <laughs> and he uh, he buys it undyed. He buys white Stroud cloth from Stroud, England. And then he, 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 you call him up and say, I need, you know, six feet or nine feet or whatever, nine yards or whatever. And, um, he will dye that in, in the, one of the two colors that you, that you ask him for. And, um, and he does a beautiful job. And, um, so, you know, so that's a challenge. And then finding the ribbon, you know, you have to, I order my ribbon from a revolutionary war reenactor supply house. Wow. And because uh, that's what it <laughs> you is. Have the sources. You know? I mean, you, <laughs> you have know to, people. <laughs> to source this stuff. It takes a while to just track it down, you know. True. And so that's a challenge. I think um I think getting the message across using symbols. Um, you know, it's not like I can paint a painting and people see a look on a face of the person in the painting mm-hmm. or or whatever, I can't, um, you know, I don't, no, I, I'm surrounded by authors. I have a family full of authors. And um, I can't, but I, I don't do that very well. It, that's their thing, not mine. Um, I, I deal in symbols. And so to get your message across um, and using 
symbols, particularly symbols that are either important to you or authentic, you know, like mm -hmm. adapting a symbol from the mounds right. in an authentic way to say what you want to say in this particular piece of work. Um, I think that's a real challenge. Um, and at first it was hard because I don't think 5% of the population of the Cherokee Nation would have recognized their own grandmother's beadwork if you laid it out in front of them because they had not seen it. It did not make the removal. It did not survive the removal. We lost our brain trust of older women who probably did most of the beadwork, if not all of mm -hmm. it. Um, we lost our trading partners, you know, and we were poor beyond all imaginings compared to what we understand today. Right. You know, there, there was no time to, to, to beat something that takes as much time as a bandolier bag, for example. And, um, and even if we could, we couldn't afford the supplies to get it. We had to feed our families, build our houses and build our barns and build our fences. And, um, so, um, I just think that, um, it, so, so that at first that was a, a big thing was just making people understand that number one, yes, Cherokees did indeed create beadwork to this is what it looked like, you know, and crack a book and see some pictures and come to understand this really rich part of our culture that had right. been forgotten. Is there anything particular that's rewarding for you as you start creating? Is it a soothing oh, aspect? Yes. Do you go, you know, do you yeah. go into a zone, so to I'm speak? A, a, <laughs> yeah. It's when things go well, you know, when you, you know, you smudge real good and, and you, I, I use, like I said, I have a thing about the numbers and when I use those numbers in, in repetitions or whatever, or in ratios or whatever, um, mm -hmm. it, it just, it works. And when I don't, I just am not comfortable with it. And so when I feel comfortable, when I can, when I can think, okay, this will work to say this. And okay, so this is what I need. I need a, I need a red rose, or I need a, mm -hmm. whatever it is. I, I need, I need water. I need whatever it is. Um, I can say this this way. This will work, and I can use these materials. And one of the pieces that um, I've done a couple of variations of recently is uh, I, the 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 concept of art is a river. And it was here before us and we will take from the river and we will give to the river and the river will just keep flowing. You know, we, we will learn from it and we will give to it, but the river doesn't stop. It's right. never stopped. It's never stopped. And so figuring out ways to get that across. And one of the ways that I've done a couple of times is to use freshwater pearls because, uh, <clears throat> pardon me, they were a favorite of our ancestors back, back in the day, back before contact. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're pretty, oh my God, they're so beautiful. And they, they make the neatest, you can tell I'm a technical person, <laughs> they make the neatest sound when they kind of rattle around, you know. Right. Um, that's another thing that's satisfying is the sound that beads make when they're, when you're messing around with them in a, mm -hmm. in their little container, you know, they just make these neat little sounds and, so you're also a Cherokee National Treasure. How do you think your your contributions to the preservation and understanding of the Cher Cherokee tradition is enveloped? Oh wow! And how do you well, think it's contributing? These days, uh, it is enveloped. It, it was a it was kind of a long pull because there were people who actively tried to say that I didn't know what I was talking about and that. And I mean, you know, here I am, I'm this little, I'll just say it. I'm a light skinned mixed blood from Texas. I mean, <laughs> oh my God. Um, and nobody in Oklahoma likes to hear anything from somebody in Texas. <laughs> and so it was an upstream swim for a while to get people to just realize this is true and this is legitimate. And um, there were some, the, the people at the Heritage, Cherokee Heritage Center were wonderful. They understood because they've done the research too. They've seen right. the photos too. And they were very excited clear back in the year 2000. Um, they asked me to do a one woman show and they were so thrilled. I remember uh, the day that we were setting it up and I remember uh, 
somebody who was very prominent in the I don't know if she liked me to name her name or not, but anyway, she was very prominent in the Heritage Center at the time. And she walked in and she said, oh, this is so thrilling to actually see these things in person to, rather than just a flat photograph. And, um, and, they, and they were very much behind it. And finally, by about 2008, we figured out, about 2006, that one way to convince people that this was really Cherokee and really authentic was to bring artifacts into Tahlequah because the Cherokees were here, but mm -hmm. the artifacts were still back east or in big museums or in Europe. And um, and so we did. We did an exhibit. Um, it opened in 2008. And I went after, they, I, they had me uh, co-curated. I went after the very best pieces that I knew of at the time, and they were spectacular. They were really beautiful. When they came in, I look at them and think, Oh my God, I'll never be this good. <laughs> and these people had like dim lighting, you know? Oh, it's just, it's just, I, I marvel. I just marvel. But one of the things we did was bring in about six or eight pieces of beadwork from Scotland that had been in Scotland for over two centuries, had never been back on this side of the Atlantic. Wow. And they were so precious and so delicate that the um, curator of the, the museum at the University of Aberdeen in Scotland, which is where they reside, um, hand carried them over and helped to unpack them and set them up and then went back. And then six months later, when the exhibit was over, came back and packed and hand carried them back. They mm -hmm. even dealt with um, the Heritage Center, went through the State Department so that they wouldn't have to open the case upon arrival and have them people palm through, Ruffle through right. delicate artifacts. Yeah. And um, since that day, since the day that show opened, I've never once heard anybody say Cherokees never did beadwork. That hmm. did it. And so the people at the Heritage Center and one particular donor who made that exhibit possible just broke the barrier. That just broke the barrier. And now um, we had, then people were curious, they wanted to learn it. So then, the, so then that enabled us to teach it. And, um, uh, and now we've got several beaters who are just extremely talented women. They happen to all be women. They don't need to all be women. They just happen to be. And, um, they, they just do exquisite work, absolutely exquisite work. And they won awards and they sell their work for good prices. And, um, you know, you have to have some incentive to spend 300 True. plus hours on a bandolier bag. You have to figure, well, maybe I can make a little money out of this. You know, I mean, right. generosity just goes so far. And um, and so they are able to do that. They're able to win good prizes and they're able to sell their work and um, and they're making names for themselves. So. I don't know even what the question was when you asked me that. I, I, just, I, you know, I just go. I just, you just launch no, me. Good. <laughs> uh, you talk about teaching and community impact. You've been, a, you've been an educator. How does teaching impact your own artistry? Um, well, it helps me learn to communicate it better because when you're trying to teach somebody how to do something, mm -hmm. um, you have to be able to get the message across. You know, you have to be able to show them. I always said, I don't just teach them how to do it. I want them to catch the vision. I want them to come to understand the importance of this work, why it was important then and why it's important now. And so I never have ever taught a class where I just sat down and taught them how to do it. I always start a full day workshop with a one hour PowerPoint. And I show them the artifacts and I tell them how it came to be so beautiful, how it came to just stop and what happened during the interim years and how it started back up again. And then show them the work of contemporary beaters. And what that does is just doesn't show only the history of beadwork. It shows Cherokee history. Right. I mean, our beadwork was started because of this. And then it stopped because of that. And then it further stopped because of the allotment. And now finally, and not and largely due to the internet, um, it, it just got fired up again. 
And um, so I think I think teaching them all of that in addition to you put the needle here and then you put the needle right. there and it's two <laughs> needles and a double thread and a single thread and you whack, whack your thread and all that. I mean, that's hugely crucial. And I'll tell you, I've never had a problem teaching anybody who wants to sit down long enough to learn it. And some people say, oh, you're only teaching Native Americans. I disagree with that because nothing tells you how smart people were and mm-hmm. how clever and how hardworking they were until you sit down and try to do it. And um, I've had many students say, I have a new appreciation for our grandmothers doing this and, because it's hard. It's hard I mean, yeah. I love it. It's easy now. But it it's not it's not something that you just roll off a log and do. Right. <laughs> In the evolution of bead artistry, have you seen the world of bead artistry evolve throughout your career? And are there any emerging trends or changes in the bead work community that particularly excite excite you or interest you? There are some things about my own work that are a result of contemporary conditions. Um, I could just only do things exactly the way they were done, but you catch on to the fact that if, if, if I want people to respect this art form, Mm -hmm. then it has to have a name for itself. It has to, it has to be seen. It has to be recognized as important and it has to be recognized as well done. And that means you have to enter art contests. And what you learn very quickly is um, what wins art contests in modern contemporary beadwork are large areas of solid beadwork with teeny, tiny, teeny, tiny little beads. I mean, that's what wins awards. And um, that is not necessarily period authentic. Some right. flaps of bandolier bags in the Southeast were beaded solidly. And, and I do that. Um, but everything else was not. It was it was spaced and laid out and beautifully laid out. When did those women back in 1700 or 1800 go to the Chicago Institute of Art? I mean, right. they just <laughs> were good at layout and design and color selection. And, um, and so, but in order to be successful in... Um, the modern world of indigenous art and to be recognized and to become imp- as an important art form, you have to be able to go to, go to some shows and win some awards and have people recognize it for what it is mm-hmm. and learn it and, and for judges to learn what's different about it and why. And um, so I do, I bead the flaps entirely and I bead smaller beads, not teeny tiny beads, but I, I bead, I use 13s for those, for that particular thing. And um, so there's some certain things you have to do. I've also learned that red bandolier bags won awards, blue, maybe not so much. You know, they just, um, hmm. they're flashier, I think. Right. Um, not that every bag I do that, an editor is red by any means, but um, uh, that's just a fat jack, you know. And so, um, so I think we're, constantly influenced by the world that we live in and the conditions that we live with and the need to make this a respectable known noticed art form and um, how how have you seen your own evolution in the last 20 plus years that you've been on this journey do you look back self-reflect and saying oh i've come this way or i've changed direction or i uh, use a different method. Yeah. Well, I know I don't really use the major methods and the major materials have to stay the same to be authentic. So I use the same stitches and I use, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but I've seen comfort with what I do. I, I feel, I feel good. I, I see something and I, and I, and I'm also frankly better at evaluating Oh, I'd love to be that, but God, I'll never be able. How can I make that work on with this medium on this this show? I mean, you know, it's it's not, for example, bandolier bags, not the most natural art form. You have you have three surfaces, one long, 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 long rectangle, mm-hmm. and one square and a triangle. <laughs> and in those 
three canvases, you have to figure out with color and number repetition and shape, how am I going to tell this story? And mm -hmm. so you become better able to look at that and say, say, you know, I tried that in 2006 and, oh, I'm not going there again. <laughs> um, and because it just is just too much, it's just too hard. And, you know, the older I get, um, it's hard to sit at a bead bench for six hours at a time. I, I do pretty well. I do well for two, three, four. I'm worried. Uh, that's it for the day. You know, no more. <laughs> and um, because I'm just older, it just, you know, you sit still for the same, in the same position for a long time. It hurts. And um, uh, so I think, I think that, but I think that, um, I think I've used to, used, learned to use color better. Um, just learned how to tell stories better and, and become comfortable telling them. And you know what I think it is? <laughs> Since I didn't grow up with this, all of the knowledge, most of the knowledge that I've acquired about Cherokee culture, Cherokee mythology, Cherokee people and being a part of Cherokee people and having top, most of my friends now are Cherokee. Most of my friends live far away in their Cherokee. Um, I finally feel like I've earned that. I belong in that space mm -hmm. and with those people. And I belong with my grandmother. You know, I belong with that woman I was trying to find from the very beginning. And um, so if there was one thing, I guess I would say, that has really evolved. It's my own sense of who I am and where I belong and where I fit in and what I feel comfortable doing and what I feel uncomfortable doing. And, um, and I've also learned patience just, mm. and that has spread into other parts of my life. And it is, it was welcome. It's very welcome. I was never a very patient person. I was really antsy in a hurry and, <laughs> You know, kind of ambitious and, and um, you know, just always had plenty to do with family and relocation and part-time job and all that stuff. And um, it, it, it took a while, but part, I think, of that, a big part of that came from beadwork, just slowing down. What does it mean to you to be a Cherokee National Treasure? Oh, it is it's humbling. We just, uh, just last week, I guess it was, um, went up to Tahlequah. They have an annual Christmas luncheon every year for all the Cherokee National Treasures and are all that are able to come. And, uh, oh man, just being in that room. It's been a decade now since they named me a treasure and just being in there. I, I These are my rock stars. I am blown away. And uh, one or two of them, I'm just like, ah, blah, blah, blah. I can't <laughs> put a sense together. I know Grayson is one of them. I just would love to sit down and have a conversation with him. And I just am totally intimidated around him. And he's the most unintimidating guy on earth. We're great Facebook friends. I love him to pieces. But when I'm in the room with him, I just can't put a sentence together. And so I just gave up. I just kind of wave and say, hi, no. But um, it's, uh, it's humbling. And it is exactly not what I thought it would be. And I'll tell you why. For because from my my experience, my journey to being there was hard um, because I'm an outsider. I was the first national treasure that was not residing in the Cherokee Nation. The first one for beadwork, lots of first, you know, lots of barriers to be broken. And um, but um, it was it took seven years. I mean, I people. Nominated me year after year after year after year. Disappointment after disappointment after disappointment. <laughs> My husband used to call it National Treasure Season. National Treasure Season because I was just <laughs> bleak for three months. And um, uh, it was, I thought, you know, if that ever happens, and I got so, I didn't think it ever would, um, I can just coast. You know, I can just coast. And it is just exactly the opposite. When it did happen, it's like, oh my God, those little letters that follows you around like PhD right. just follows your name around everywhere it goes, you know? And it's like, I represent Cherokee Nation now. I represent those people, past, mm -hmm. present, and future. And I can't 
slide. I can't stop. I don't want to stop, but I can't. I need to continue to create. I need to continue to learn, which I do. I have, I'm so grateful because I learn from every piece I make. I learn something new, some understanding of a myth or a story, some understanding of myself, some technique, some better way to do this or whatever, um, better thread to use. Um, and, but it's, it's not been coast at all. It's been sort of a rededication to all those people that I walk into their room and I'm starstruck, you know, and I think I owe it to them to do my best. Can you think of a piece that would, could be your legacy piece to date that epitomizes your career and your journey as a beat artist? Wow. Um, well, you know, yeah, the next one. <laughs> the next one. Oh, 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 I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. I'm gonna do this. And I'm going to use this and I'm going to use that. And oh, I like that color combination. And uh, I've always wanted to find a way to put this blue with this green. And, you know, and so it's kind of always the next one. I, I That's kind of me. You know, I, I'm, I guess I'm a real optimistic person. And um, uh, I just always think the next one's going to be better. And, you know, <laughs> uh, often it is. You know, but sometimes it's uh, just a, a a lesson to learn. The next one is a lesson to learn. But I have to say, I'm not I'm not ashamed of any of my bead work. I'm not embarrassed for people to see it, especially if they understand the year it was created. Um, I there is one piece that I regret. The the when I had that one woman show, one of the pieces was bought was purchased by Cherokee Heritage Center. It is the first bandolier bag I ever created, and it is awful. It is wrong. The wrong <laughs> materials. The colors are terrible. The design is awful. The layout's bad. Everything about it is just awful. And I have told the curator there before, I will make you a new one and trade you if you just give me that bag. Because they just <laughs> keep putting it on the wall with my name on it. You know, I think, oh, God. But... um but you know that's the process, though. That's important. That's your own evolution, yeah. Yeah, that that matters. So as um, I do have a little bag, plastic bag, full of the early, early beadwork. The before I was doing southeastern, and it is in the bottom drawer of my um, my supply cabinet. And every once in a while, if I have a real discouraging day, which I don't, I don't have, I don't get discouraged much anymore. This, I like being 75 years old. You can start to like yourself and you start to understand what you're doing and you kind of figure out this, this manual to the, this book of life. And, right. um, but on those days, once in a while, I'll go in there and dig that stuff out. And it's very encouraging to see that I, I, my stuff doesn't look like this anymore. And no, nobody will ever see that. I'm not <laughs> sure they've even seen that stuff. Are there any upcoming projects or directions your artistry might take in the future or anything um, that's coming well, up that I you want to talk a, about? Um, well, I, I don't want to name particular locations, but um, I do have a, a kind of a lecture potential coming up if we can get it scheduled um, right. Um, but it's, it, well, I'm excited about that university lecture. Every time a university, a university or a museum asked me to come talk to them and, Oh, it's such an honor, and it's a little bit of a, uh, it's a little bit intimidating. It's a lot intimidating, but it's almost <laughs> like people who call you up and say, "You want to do a podcast?" I think, there sure, you go. and then and then I think, how do I get myself into these things? <laughs> but because you know, when it comes down to it, you think, "Hey, I've got to do this well. I need to do this right." And um, but yeah, so you know, some lecture experiences, and then I'm going to be in a in an exhibit. Um, uh, one of the photographs I sent you guys was um, when the Highlands met the mounds and it mm -hmm. is going to be part of an exhibit in uh, the North Carolina Museum of Art uh, this coming I guess year and um, uh, it I, I like it because it is the story of my own family it is it is it is my daughter's it's a physical presentation of my daughter's genealogy um, my husband, who's descended from Jacobites, um, and my, the first 
person who married into my Cherokee line was Jacobite. And Dave and I met seven generations later, which is very important. And, um, and so I did this bag. It's very different. It's not on a red or blue Stroud. It is on the Montrose, um, the um, Graham of Montrose Tartan. Okay. Uh, All right. Which was a Jacobite. Yeah. If you know the I Jacobite. I think we might be related then. <laughs> yeah. 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 Probably were. Um, and um, and it, it uses Southeastern mound builder symbolism mm -hmm. on this to tell the story of my daughter's genealogy. And so hmm. I'm kind of excited about that coming up, that that's going to be um, there and um, that they appreciate that and have in, that they invited me, you know. Yeah. And well, then Cherokee Art Market. At, we do Cherokee Art Market every year, my daughter and I do. She, by the way, you might be interested in knowing, um, she is she does Cherokee finger weaving from the same period of time, which oh, really? is very, very, very delicate. Mm -hmm. um, she takes a skein of tiny little thin yarn and beads. And she weaves beads into create a design in oblique weaving. And um, it's like the, the work that was being done back at the same time period that I work in, which is roughly American Revolutionary, uh, Revolution to the Removal. Mm -hmm. And um, she's just, her work is exquisite. And uh, she and I share a booth at uh, Cherokee Art Market every year. And she demonstrates her finger weaving. I will weaving. definitely have to check you out next year yeah. when I'm she's there. She's Karen Barrett, yeah. What was the name of the Jacobite you're related to or descended from? Uh, well, John Jack Ward and Brian Ward, who's ma okay. who married Nancy Ward. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I'm a, a descendant of Nancy Ward as well. Are you? Uh, through... <laughs> well, I'm actually a step descendant. Yeah. Okay. I'm uh, through John Walker. Okay. One of her husbands. I think, you know, <laughs> I had a, a, I have a friend who's Cherokee and um, we were, I, I upon meeting her and shaking hands with her at a, some kind of gathering. And um, she says something about her genealogy. And, and I think I've got that little look that you get, oh, okay, let me, you know, that kind of little look like yeah. you're figuring, yours, <laughs> figuring out how you're related. And she said, I'll save you the time. Yeah, we're probably related. And yeah. <laughs> that's really true. If you're Cherokee, we're probably related. Our family survived it. We're probably related. Yes, yes, exactly. Do you have any aspirations or goals um, you'd like to achieve within the realm of bead artistry? Yeah, I hope it doesn't die with me. Um, I And I don't think it's it's not going to at this point. No. I have uh, two beaters in particular. I have several, but, you know, not everybody can take the time to do it all the time. And mm -hmm. I haven't, you know, they're, they're, this one is taking a break to do this. This one's taking a break to do that. But I have two in particular who... Um, who do absolutely exquisite work and are really building names for themselves. And um, at least one of them now is taking up teaching. And, um, you know, when I, when I started on this and realized that there was not an open arm welcome for Cherokee beadwork to return to the Cherokees, I thought, well, you have to do two things. You have to grow beaders, you have to grow collectors, and you have to grow mm -hmm. brokers in the forms of galleries and museums who can bring the beaters and the collectors together. It never occurred to me that it would become successful enough that you'd have to grow teachers. And sure. um, so you that continue. now is what we're doing is growing teachers and um, so that we can just continue this on. That is the most important thing beadwork wise um, is that, that this not be something that again, dies we, it, that just true can't i think it's yeah. for for our people to continue forward and continue this journey of who we are you know we can't by, uh, let it pause or we yeah, yeah or dissipate again yeah exactly what advice would you give uh, to aspiring beat artists especially those that are wanting to connect to their to the art with their cultural heritage um the first piece of advice that just leaps to mind is you can't rush good bead work. You can rush crappy bead work, but you can't rush the good stuff. And so take a big, deep breath, settle in. And once you learn the basic techniques, it's very relaxing. I mean, it really is. Um, uh, you know, I can just sit and bead and we'll, ha we'll have some something on TV. And we'll sit all evening, every evening, almost every evening. And, um, you know, it's relaxing. I can just do it and watch and 
make decisions and, you know, if I'm creating a piece or something, that's a little bit different. I need mm. my, I need more of my brain for that, but <laughs> learn to relax and just absorb it. Just sit there and just take in what it's teaching you. And, um, you won't know what it's teaching you for a while, but you'll figure it out. Just give it time. And, um, you know, above all, enjoy it. And uh, like I said, what I basically do is make pretty things. And I love to make pretty things. And the fact that I can just make something, I mean, it's a crummy world sometimes. Yep. People need pretty things. There's nothing really? wrong with just making something pretty. And um, the fact that I can do that and also get the message through to people, at least from time to time, that is a gift. And so I would say just take a deep breath, sit down, relax, learn to make mistakes because that's how you learn to not make True. mistakes. Through artwork and through life, you know? Yeah, yeah. Teaches us. <laughs> is, yeah. There a memor- is there a memorable... <laughs> <laughs> okay, the tongue tied. Is there a moment in your life or experience in your career that you deeply impacted your perspective as an artist? Ooh, um, Memorable. <laughs> I, I think out. just, um, um, I don't know if it was a moment, it, it was just this nagging thing that I needed to know who my people were and how they lived and, and when they came on the trail and, you know, what was their specific journey like? Where did mm-hmm. they live? We know exactly where they live. My husband is a genealogist and my, as a hobby, and we know exactly where they lived on Wards Creek outside Delonica, Georgia. We know exactly where they live. And, um, you know, those, those kinds of discoveries, but the first time I saw um, our, our Dawes rolls and saw my grandmother's name and saw, um, you know, my two older uncle's names. My dad was born too late. He's called it too late. And, um, uh, the, the first time I saw those just nuggets of, of history, I mean, physical things, photographs, you know, story, individual stories that are individually mine. Um, I think that probably impacted not just my work, but my life and my thinking. And, um, and bit by bit, you know, um, I, I always talk to Tonya Weevil. She's a, she's a fabulous textile artist, Cherokee textile artist. And, um, we talk about learning the, learning what the symbols meant, these mm-hmm. pre-contact symbols, some of which have been, their meaning has been forgotten. And, um, we, we just find a, a little tiny, a little tiny piece of information here and there. And we start to add it together. And we, I, we always say, crumb by crumb, we're building a feast. Mm. Crumb by crumb, we're building a feast. Bead by bead, you're building a masterpiece. And um, I think that whole way of looking at life um, just changed my life. So you know, in that way, beadwork just flat out changed it in terms of the way I think and the way I feel. What was the very first award that you received? And do you remember the piece? Do you still have that piece or has it been sold? Uh, and- I, don't, I don't have anything except the one that I'm sitting to North Carolina right now. Everything is sold. Um, I've been very blessed that way. Um, the very first award would have been at um, uh, Cherokee Heritage Center. And I, I don't know if it would have been the, I guess the Trail of Tears art show probably. No, not Trail of Tears. The um, Cherokee Homecoming art show. It may have been Trail of Tears. Trail of Tears. I'll have to look that back up. But um, uh, it was it was astounding. You know, it was amazing that um, somebody cared enough to select that, and somebody understood the art form enough to to award something like that to me. And um, it was oh, uh, cherish. It still is. And um, uh, so it would have had. You know. If you gave me time, I could figure, I could look up which one it was. It was one of the early bags, which are far, far less ornate than than I make these days. Um, uh, but that was all I knew how to do in those days, you know. And um, but yeah, that was. I mean, you know, that just speaks volumes to you when you want to award right. something that is like 
it's validation. It feels good. It feels real good. And it makes you want to do more. True. So saying that, doing more, do you have a stockpile of ideas of things you want to create? Um, I kind of just let that flow. And yeah. thank heavens, knock on wood, <laughs> I've never, not, oh, I'm superstitious, um, I've, I've never not had an idea. I've never not had something I want to do. I've had two or three that I started and then for some reason or another didn't continue because something else came up or whatever, or I didn't like the way, for example, I have a bandolier bag I've wanted to do for God over a decade, but I don't like the way I beat hummingbirds and it really needs to have a hummingbird because it's an <laughs> homage to a Cherokee woman to whom I own a great deal, which is Anna Mitchell. And, um, I owe her everything. And she, she was such a, she gave such encouragement to me at the beginning when I had so little confidence and, um, I want to do an homage to her, but it requires a hummingbird. And I don't think I do a hummingbird justice. So see, I'm still learning all the time and studying and trying to figure out, I got to crack that nut because I want to do that thing. <laughs> do you collaborate with other beat artists? In work? You know, I never have. Um, it's just never come up. Um, I wouldn't be against it. Certainly. I just, it's just never happened. Um, and I, you know, I usually, I'm a little feisty sometimes in terms of plans for this and plans for that, you know, and I, I've kind of have to have things lined out. It'll change a thousand times and that's okay. But I kind of <laughs> need to have a plan, you know, I'm not real comfortable just treading water. And, um, so, uh, I don't, I've just thought, oh, I'm just going to launch into this and do it. You know, it's never dawned on me to right. get with somebody else to do half the work. That would really be a good idea. But, you know, <laughs> that's just not my personality, I guess. Well, Martha, is there anything else you'd like to share with us or promote and tell us about? Oh, just a huge thank you. Oh, well, if you people are interested in looking online. Um, Absolutely. They, there, there's more information about me, and but lots and lots and lots of photographs of my beadwork um, on my website, which is www.berrybeadwork.com. And um, it's, uh, if they don't know what Southeastern, if not familiar with Southeastern beadwork, uh, there's history there. There's, but lots and lots and lots and lots of photographs. And um, so that's, I, I always send people there if you want, just if you're interested and you want to learn about Southeastern beadwork, that's a good place to go. And then um, my Facebook page is Martha Berry, Cherokee beadwork artist. Uh, and, and it's uh, not, not nearly as many photos or as much information. It's Facebook. It's fun. Right. And I always, but I post um, announcements if I'm going to uh, teach a class or if I'm going to do a lecture, if I'm going to be in an exhibit or something like that, that if you're interested in knowing that, that's the place to go for that. Well, it's been a joy and a pleasure to have you on the show today. And thank you for taking the time. Oh, I had a ball. Thank you so oh, much. Great. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, Martha, continue to success and uh, we will chat soon. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you for embarking on this artistic journey with us. Keep exploring, keep creating. Until we meet again, let your imagination soar beyond the art. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us on your preferred podcast platform.